thank you, Maas, for the introduction. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, so I think now you can uh, can see my screen. Good afternoon, ladies uh, and gentlemen in, uh, in Europe, and those of you who follow us from uh, the Americas, good, uh, good morning. Uh, it's good to have you together, uh, and what I will do in the next uh, 40 to 50 minutes is guide you through uh, two new applications that we recently have introduced in uh, the newest version, Diana 9.5. And these versions, uh, th these new applications are with respect to uh, design checks. And check how much reinforcement, uh, steel reinforcement, is uh, according to uh, design codes, in particular the Euro code uh, in this case, uh, in uh, reinforced concrete uh, plate type of structures. Uh, but we will also outline uh, how uh, a new approach in calculating crack bits. Uh, considering nonlinear material behavior of concrete, including cracking, uh, can be uh, used in optimizing design and also in uh, uh, assessing the loading capabilities of structures. And we will uh, illustrate that by uh, by two examples. One is a box girder bridge, and the other one is a concrete plate uh, lying on a steel frame. So, as I already uh, mentioned, is in the last years, Euro codes have uh, been, uh, been, 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 been introduced and uh, are a common practice now in uh, most European uh, countries. The good thing is that there is more uniformity uh, in the approach in, uh, in the different uh, countries. And the other good thing in the Eurocode is that there is much more opening than before for also doing advanced analysis. Um, design checks in, uh, in general uh, so far combined with finite element analysis were most of the times done with relatively simple finite element models. Uh, we say reduced finite element types as plate elements and beam elements. And that's not so strange because if you look to yeah, this picture that you see here, uh, this is uh, of uh, a building, uh, you see it's a very rec regular shape. Uh, which you see uh, walls in gray, you see plate for floors in orange, and you see uh, columns uh, with uh, vertical lines and some beams. Uh, but all is modeled with uh, what we call reduced elements, which are the traditional blade, uh, plate elements and, uh, and beam elements. And these uh, elements work very efficiently, but have some, some limitations. What well, we will show uh, and explain to you in this presentation is that with modern techniques uh, we can get more out design analysis and make the design more optimal. So let's first have a look in the present way of working. As I explained already, uh, um, the finite element model is usually composed of beam and plate elements. And you see that illustrated here with a very simple uh, girder model uh, with a number of, uh, of beam elements with two supports and a vertical force a loading point in, uh, in the middle. And we do then a linear calculation. Uh, the real configuration of the girder is described with a single line, as you see in this picture. And by doing the linear finite element analysis, we can calculate the cross-section forces and the bending um, moment diagrams. And these two results are the input in the design checks. It can be Eurocode, but the same applies to other design codes. So uh, the user needs to define a, a maximum allowable crack width. It is uh, dependent on the uh, uh, 
conditions that uh, your construction uh, is on, and the design codes uh, using the input of cross-section forces and bending moments give you then uh, information about how much steel is required to make sure that your uh, maximum crack width does not exceed this limit value. That is the traditional way in doing design analysis with linear elastic finite element models. Um, and usually uh, the nonlinear finite element analysis is, 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 is not used in the design stage. That's because uh, engineers uh, still consider uh, doing a nonlinear analysis as something that is is complex, uh, which requires the back to the choice of uh, material parameters and analysis procedures, and also calculation times are traditionally very long. But things are changing at the moment. Computers are very fast nowadays, and nonlinear analysis can give additional information. But still, we see. Uh, that in practice, uh, nonlinear analysis is only very rarely applied in the design of new structures. Uh, nevertheless, this could be very interesting to consider the nonlinear behavior because if we could predict crack width development with increasing loading, we can check the remaining capacity. Uh, in a construction when it is designed purely only on the design codes. And situations, it is very good to do such check and not only consider the design codes as a black box, uh, but have more insight in where is the additional capacity. And that is, for example, illustrated with this figure that you see here below, which is a uh, four-point bending of a reinforced concrete uh, bar. Um, we have uh, two loading points and two support points. And with the colors here in the finite elements, uh, you see the crack pattern uh, at a critical stage. Initially, uh, the bending cracks uh, will be uh, will, 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 will occur, and then there will be some localization of the cracks on the other side of the reinforcement bars here on the top and the bottom of the beam, and then at a certain moment the shear cracks will uh, will come in. And the red color uh, means here that that are the elements with the highest crack opening, the crack width, and green is medium, where blue is uh, only very small. So, if we know that we have these uh, two different approaches, uh, that there is a benefit uh, in, 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 in doing, considering nonlinear behavior in the design process, um, the reason that we have introduced these new, these two new applications in Diana, design approach and stiffness adaptation, is because we want to make both available for you in an easier, more efficient way than it was so far. So we think you could better design structures, better make decisions about what is the loading capacity of structure if we have numerical tools in which we can calculate the required amount of uh, we call that doing the design, the design application, new application in Diana. And with the same model, uh, uh, when you have calculated the amount of reinforcement that is needed according to the design codes, you can define that in the model. And with the same model, we can do a stiffness adaptation analysis in which we can calculate for different load conditions, uh, different load levels, the crack pattern and the crack width, uh, and also the stresses in the reinforcement, so also the yielding of the reinforcement. That's illustrated, for example, with the two pictures that you see here. This is half of a, uh, again, a four-point uh, reinforced uh, uh, beam with the reinforcement bar at, uh, at the bottom. You see here the crack width calculated by a stiffness uh, adaptation analysis. The same 
loading conditions, we can calculate the stresses in the reinforcement and also uh, makes it very, very clearly how far the stresses are away from the yield stress, uh, which is the maximum of this, uh, this power scale here. Okay, that is the background. That's what we want to achieve. But Let's first now go a little bit more in detail and uh, try to explain how this new design application, this new design functionality in Diana works. A key point is that it works for reinforcement grids, which should be defined in your model as embedded reinforcements. Um, this is a concept that has been explained in, in, in earlier uh, web uh, sessions, uh, but you can define embedded reinforcements in Diana independent of your finite element grid on the exact location as uh, the reinforcement bars and grids are located in, in your construction, which makes it rather straightforward and easy to do. And the program then calculates the intersection of such a reinforcement grid and individual elements, as explained, for example, here. Uh, this is a hexahedron, eight-node hexahedron element with a reinforcement grid. Uh, and such reinforcement grid particle in a solid is, in fact, an additional element which is connected, which has the same displacement degrees of freedom of the solid element in which it is located, but it has additional um, uh, stress uh, degrees of freedom uh, in because this here grid in two uh, directions. And in both of these directions, uh, for the rim, it, an equivalent thickness should be defined. So, uh, that is an equivalent thickness that is the same stiffness values as the individual bars that you see here with the black dots. Uh, they have a, a diameter and from the diameter we can calculate the cross-section uh, area uh, and then we divide that by the distance or between two bars, uh, the spacing, then we have an equivalent thickness of such a grid in a certain direction. And what this design application in Diana does is that for given moments and forces from a linear elastic analysis, we assume that part of these forces is transferred by uh, the force in the reinforcement grid, which, has a, which is defined by on one hand the equivalent thickness of the reinforcement grid and on the other hand the maximum stress, the yield stress that the reinforcement can carry. And of course the compressive force which is carried by the, reinfor by the concrete part which you see here. And the FD is the absolute internal beam arm which is automatically calculated by this design application. And that gives information about how much reinforcement is needed for this given, lo given loading conditions. So, how does this work? Um, the user defines a slab that can be with, uh, with shell elements, or plate elements, or even with solid elements. But it is always a plate type of structure, and in this uh, slab, uh, reinforcement grids need to be defined by the user. And here, this, uh, reinfor this, this plate and two reinforcement grids, one in the uh, x direction and one in the y direction, are extracted uh, from uh, each other, so for, 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 for graph, so to make it more uh, clear for, uh, for you. But the idea is the user defines these grids on the location, on the relocation in the model. And then, uh, to these grids in both directions, uh, diameter and spacing uh, of the bars is defined as well as material properties for the steel and the concrete. So we are talking about the yield stress of the steel, uh, the maximum stress that the steel can carry, an environment class which defines in fact the uh, uh, maximum allowable crack width, and the tensile, uh, sorry, the compressive the tensile strength of, uh, of the concrete. Um, 
of course, uh, to this model, also different load combinations can be defined. Um, when you want to, you can also define in the design application, or calculate load envelopes over individual loadings or over load combinations. And then the checks, how much reinforcement is free? Required can be performed for individual load cases or load combinations or for load envelopes. So let's now uh, illustrate uh, how this uh, works in uh, in practice. Here you have a quarter of a plate which is supported on one corner and a uh, distributed uh, load that we consider. So it's a quarter of a concrete floor. Uh, the user needs to define a reinforcement grid uh, with a certain coverage at, uh, at the bottom and reinforcement uh, um, diameter for the bars and a spacing, center to center distance in both directions in the grid need to be defined. That's input that the user needs to define in, uh, in the Diana model. And then the checks are performed and the user can select which type of which kind of results he wants. Uh, and results can be uh, grouped in results related to the amount of reinforcement or related to crack width control. So one of the results is that the user can check the amount of reinforcement that he has applied, that has been applied, so affect the input. That's what you, for example, see in this picture. This is for the design analysis, the applied equivalent thickness in the local for the combination ultimate limit state number one. And so you see a color plot. So apparently in this reinforcement grid, we have two sections. And for both sections, we have defined either either a different diameter of the bars or a different uh, distance of the bar, between the bars. So this is just check of input, but another output item is, for example, the required amount of reinforcement, which is illustrated here uh, as a contour plot in each of the particles of the reinforcement grid. And then you see this varying, you see some peaks at the support points, which are in fact singular points uh, for the calculated forces and, uh, um, and, um, and, 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 and bending moments. Another result item is that these two the applied and required amount of reinforcements are related to each other. So we calculate the ratio between these two, which gives the results as you see here. Now, this ratio of course, the required should be, uh, um, this, this ratio should be, should be less than, uh, than one. We have a singular point and design code, uh, the euro code, uh, allows you to, to average results over a certain uh, spread width, which is related to the thickness of, uh, of the plate. And this the Diana design uh, function gives you the possibility that you can define an, uh, a spread distance over which these results for ratio required uh, over, uh, over applied can be automatically calculated and presented again in a contour plot. As you see here, uh, then the critical values are lower, uh, even uh, less than uh, that's the principle on how the design check analysis uh, module works in, uh, in Diana. Um, the other new module that I want to explain to you is the stiffness adaptation approach. Of course, we can do also full nonlinear uh, analysis in Diana, but the stiffness adaptation approach is uh, a more pragmatic approach, which is much easier to use. Can be uh, used, uh, the user has more capabilities, more possibilities to uh, select uh, between accurate solution and short calculation times or, uh, uh, sorry, accurate solution and, um, and, and 
analysis times or a first guess, a rough approximation with less accurate results and a shorter analysis times. What we want to do with these stiffness adaptation analysis is that we want to give insight in where cracks will um, will occur in, uh, in, 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 in the construction and how big the crack widths will be for different uh, loading levels. So this is a very efficient tool in calculating the remaining capacity of the structures and an alternative of the design codes uh, checks that uh, yeah, I have uh, explained uh, before. So in doing this stiffness adaptation analysis, uh, we are considering the nonlinear behavior of the material. Uh, so we are doing a uh, uh, stiffness adaptation analysis and the nonlinear material behavior is defined uh, with a uniaxial relation between the stresses and strains, which is very strongly schematized in this picture. Here you see uh, stress on the vertical axis and strain on the horizontal axis. And this is the typical uniaxial stress strain uh, behavior for uh, plain concrete. In this area we have the tension, in this area we have the compression behavior. And we see initially the material is nicely uh, linear elastic uh, when the strain increases, the stress increases up to a certain maximum tensile strength, tensile stress, which is tensile strength. And from there, the crack uh, is initiated, uh, the strain can increase, uh, but the stress will uh, reduce. And an important parameter is how much energy can be absorbed by the concrete during this opening of, uh, of the crack. And that's defined by the fracture energy. Uh, on the same side, uh, similar behavior we, we see for on, the, on the compressive side. Yeah, the compressive side, the compressive strength is much higher than the tensile uh, strength. And usually we uh, do not follow uh, the material up to complete uh, failure. That's why uh, for this uh, uh, approach here we have only defined these critical parameters, the Young's modulus, the tensile strength, the fracture energy and the compressor strength. And the nice thing for um, this uh, stiffness adaptation approach is that the user can either define these parameters explicitly uh, or he can refer to different design codes. It can be Euro code or SEPFIP code or different American codes or Asian codes. Uh, you're selecting concrete classes and then automatically uh, Diana uh, will, uh, will, will, will use the uh, uh, relative, uh, related uh, uh, material parameters. And similar behavior, we need to define uh, the uniaxial behavior for uh, the steel reinforcements if we want to consider in our analysis also the failure of the steel reinforcements. But steel is a more simple material because it has similar behavior in, com in ten tension and in, uh, in compression. You see here the yield stress, which is the same in both directions under normal conditions. Uh, so that means we have only two parameters which are critical here, which is the elastic model uh, maximum stress, which is the, the yield stress of, uh, of the steel reinforcement. And the principle of stiffness adaptation analysis is that we will do a sequence of linear elastic analysis in which in every new analysis uh, the stiffness at the location of crack will be reduced. And cracks are those places where stresses occur which are higher than the tensile strength. So that allows us that the crack can increase with increasing load. That's not very accurately described yeah, because we have seen that in the previous picture here huh, when uh, the crack grows and we are on this branch uh, the stress is reducing but usually, uh, um, sorry I need to go forward here, 
we say we have a construction and we have a, 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 a loading on the construction which we increase in steps, we see a load redistribution in the, uh, in the concrete. Uh, there, those locations where cracks occur are unloading and on other locations which are not cracked, they are loading, the, the, the load are, is, is increasing. And so that is what is uh, explained here and that can be very nicely described with uh, this stiffness adaptation analysis. Here we see again the uniaxial stress strain curve, uh, the strain axis and the stress axis with uh, the uh, tension part of the curve in, uh, in red. Uh, and then we have at a certain moment in the analysis, in a certain point in the concrete, a stress that is uh, beyond uh, so the, uh, what is allowed by the uh, stress strain curve. We need to correct the stiffness locally, so we need to reduce the stiffness, the Young's modulus, such that the stress will be reduced also, that uh, it will match this uniaxial stress strain curve. That's also explained by this uh, flow chart. So we apply the load in general in load increments. We every new linear analysis we set up the uh, linear stiffness matrix, which we consider the modifications uh, of the uh, the reductions of the Young's modulus on those points where the Young's modulus is reduced. We solve the linear set of equations, we calculate the minimum and maximum principal stresses and strains at all integration points and we check uh, whether they are in agreement with this uh, user-defined uniaxial stress-strain relation. And we can then uh, yeah, update the material parameters if we allow to do uh, another iteration, uh, we adapt the stiffness in the integration points and we do another run. Up to, we say, now we have done enough iterations for this load increment. That can be because we have reached the maximum number of iterations that is defined by the user or because there are no points anymore that uh, do not satisfy uh, this, uh, this condition. And that point, we say, uh, okay, then that is the situation at the end of this load increment and for this point uh, we will uh, export the results to the output uh, device and we can continue with the next load increment. So, the user can describe, uh, the material input is relatively easy, uh, you can uh, simply refer to, uh, to, to different uh, design codes. Uh, the user has some, some options uh, to limit the number of uh, iterations, of course, then and, 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 and to, to select the uh, load increments. Of course, large load increments and large, small number of uh, iterations uh, um, give uh, not accurate results, uh, but on the other hand, it is very easy to get an initial understanding uh, uh, about uh, where the nonlinear behavior, uh, the cracking will, uh, will, will occur in the construction and then you can refine easily in a second stage. Uh, and if you do small load increments and enough iteration uh, in, uh, load increments, then you can very nicely uh, predict uh, crack patterns. Of course, the, it's a nonlinear analysis, so the loading history needs to be described accurately. Um, and uh, no, you can get all kinds of uh, results as you get from, uh, from a nonlinear analysis. That means stress, strains, at different load increments, displacement, stiffness reductions, and also crack width. So now let's have a look at uh, the two. Uh, bridges, that, uh, the two examples that we want to uh, discuss in, uh, in this presentation. First, first is, uh, the, the, um, is a viaduct in uh, the southeastern part of, uh, of the Netherlands, which is the, the Hetere viaduct. Um, 
which is uh, a viaduct that has been uh, constructed uh, as uh, go. Uh, and the traffic load that it is uh, being exposed to today is uh, much higher than the traffic load uh, for which it was originally designed. And it's also a few years ago that um, during monitoring uh, some, 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 some damage to parts of uh, the concrete uh, webs uh, was, uh, was found. Uh, so the assessment, uh, the loading capacity of the bridge uh, need to be, uh, be assessed. You see here uh, an overview of, uh, of the bridge. You see there are two points where there are joints between the uh, different uh, parts uh, and that's uh, yeah uh, in a schematic uh, cross section uh, uh, illustrated uh, in uh, in this uh, picture here you see uh, a, a, a side view of uh, of the bridge during uh, during construction uh, so we going to look into the, the crack behavior, whether we can reproduce that with the stiffness adaptation analysis, so the loading history, also the construction history, need to be considered uh, for that. And you see that uh, at this location of the joint, initially there was a temporary support uh, applied here uh, before the, the joint uh, was, uh, was uh, installed. So, in this analysis, we do not uh, model the bridge with reduced elements. We want to describe the whole geometry as accurately as possible. So, we used a, a BIM approach uh, to, of uh, five segments. Uh, around uh, one of, uh, of the joints, uh, so five segments or with a length of 16 meters uh, each, uh, uh, which uh, are illustrated uh, here, and we focus on, uh, on the middle uh, uh, part uh, with, uh, with, uh, with, with, with the joint uh, included, which is uh, zoomed in uh, here. You see all all details, uh, uh, the slab with irregular shapes, uh, the different uh, webs, some thickness variations in the webs and also in the bottom. Uh, there are some, uh, some ends with uh, manholes and uh, some anchor points uh, which can be uh, illustrated. And this is only the concrete part which is modeled with elements. Uh, but also the different pre-stressed cables were um, included uh, in the model with uh, pre-stress, uh, with, uh, with, with pre uh, of course, 45 different uh, cables. Uh, there were pre-stress bars in the top flange, the upper flange, uh, which were modeled with individual uh, bars. There were some uh, pre-stress transverse uh, cables in uh, the end uh, parts of, uh, of the slab, which are zoomed in uh, here. And there were a lot of long longitudinal uh, bars with different uh, thickness and different uh, sections, different grids are illustrated in uh, this part of uh, this cross section and you see uh, different tips uh, and uh, they are modeled here with, uh, with, uh, with, with, with individual uh, bars. So this geometry of uh, uh, the central part of uh, the viaduct was uh, meshed. We used uh, a structural measure for uh, an accurate uh, description of um, uh, the, uh, the stresses in the different uh, components and where the part where during observations um, cracks was, were observed was uh, here between the, uh, the joint and uh, the support at uh, the tent uh, pier where we have chosen to apply a uh, refined mesh which uh, you see here. Um, we are going to do 
first design checks in this model. So we have the three reinforcement uh, grids, which are illustrated here in the cross section by uh, the dark blue surfaces. And for each of these uh, grids, the uh, applied diameter and spacings in both x and y direction for these grids are, uh, are defined. And we also define so-called composed elements, which are in fact surface elements, which define the reference uh, in the cross-section of, uh, of the webs of uh, the uh, uh, concrete uh, parts, which we need to calculate the cross-section forces and bending moments of the individual slabs. Then, uh, in the analysis, we need to yeah, give some specifications about, uh, you can specify national annex and environment class and construction. And from this, the software knows uh, what is the uh, allowed uh, crack uh, width for which uh, uh, the check uh, should be uh, should be done, and uh, of course, uh, load combinations uh, need to be uh, defined, which you see here. One point two uh, was uh, the safety factor uh, for uh, the uh, permanent loading, and one point five for the variable uh, loading. And then uh, Diana calculates for uh, this load combination, the required uh, amount of reinforcement in the vertical direction in each of these grids. Uh, um, so, when this check is, uh, is done, we want to calculate the crack width development in this same part of, uh, of the model. And therefore, we need to define the uh, uniaxial stress uh, strain curve. In this model, only for this part of the model, we applied uh, the nonlinear behavior. That means all the other five, other four segments and the remaining parts of this center segments were considered as uh, linear elastic models. That means that Diana automatically uh, internally defines a substructure so that a uh, solution can be calculated very efficiently. Um, so, um, the reinforcement uh, properties are defined for, uh, for these reinforcement uh, grids and then uh, yeah, the loading sequence, uh, first the permanent uh, loadings and then uh, stepwise the uh, uh, local loadings, uh, the truck loadings are, uh, are increased uh, step by step. And here you see the uh, uh, as calculated uh, on this scale, which is in uh, millimeters. So at the end of the scale, red is a half uh, a millimeter uh, crack uh, width. Uh, this is for load factor uh, 1.5. Uh, now we go to load factor 2, uh, in which you see crack openings of 0.2 millimeters. Um, Sorry, I need to continue. Uh, this is for load factor 3, uh, in which uh, you see not only uh, cracks uh, in, the, in the webs, but also uh, uh, in the, the flange diagonal uh, crack is uh, calculated. And the same analysis gives us also insight in the vertical stresses or horizontal stresses in the reinforcement grids, uh, which are displayed here. We increment the load step by step, and see here uh, that uh, with a load factor 3, uh, the, in, in one of the, the grids, the yield stress was, uh, was, was reached. So this analysis contributed to some uh, re-strengthening measurements to, uh, to, to this uh, bridge, and we did the check uh, of the same bridge uh, again, and uh, the analysis uh, proved uh, that uh, the bridge is uh, safe uh, after that. That brings us to the second example, which uh, is the assessment uh, of loading capacity of an existing bridge. Um, this is a viaduct. In fact, it is a concrete plate with an irregular shape, which consists of three different uh, slabs, as you see here, part number one, central part, and part number three, which is resting on a concrete uh, slab. 
a concrete uh, frame. And the frame is uh, both ends, but also uh, at uh, the two points, two points central uh, under these uh, joints, uh, the cutting lines of, uh, of the concrete uh, plates. So here you see a, a detail at the bottom side of uh, the bridge. Um, you see the steel work uh, with the main longitudinal girders, some uh, transverse steel girders uh, and some uh, smaller longitudinal uh, girders here, where all the steel is modeled with shell elements and the concrete uh, plate is modeled with, uh, with concrete, uh, with, with, with solid uh, elements. A detail of the cross section of the bridge is shown in, uh, in, uh, in this uh, picture. And you see here the steel uh, parts and uh, the concrete uh, slab here. And order displacement elements for uh, all, both the shell elements for the steel as well as for the solid elements for, uh, for the concrete. Uh, and uh, what you see here is that uh, uh, there are some, uh, yeah, some, some, some interfaces, interface elements were applied uh, between uh, the concrete and uh, the steel parts. In the steel parts, in the steel Concrete, sorry, in the concrete deck, we uh, we define a uh, composed surface, uh, which we need for uh, the design check for calculating the uh, cross-section forces and, uh, and bending moments, and we have the reinforcement grids, or in longitudinal direction and transverse direction at the top of the uh, of the deck and at the bottom of uh, of the deck which is illustrated here with uh, the green uh, lines. And then we have the different loading conditions. First we have uh, the, the asphalt uh, distributed loading on uh, the bridge uh, deck, which is illustrated here by uh, this. Of course we have the weight load, which is not illustrated. We have a permanent loading on uh, second permanent secondary loading, uh, traffic loadings, more on the footpath uh, parts of, uh, of the bridge. We have uh, a permanent uh, traffic loading on uh, the, bed, the bridge uh, deck. And then we have uh, the, the different positions of uh, the mobile uh, loading uh, on one uh, lane, which you see uh, here, and uh, on the second lane. Uh, which you see here, and we need to combine the most critical parts of uh, yeah, the traffic loading, uh, concentrated loading on both uh, lanes uh, with uh, the permanent loading. There are two additional cases in which the truck load is uh, located uh, a little bit uh, in between the two, uh, two lanes. What can we calculate? With a linear elastic analysis for each individual load, for example the weight load, we can calculate the displacements uh, of uh, the concrete uh, deck, as you see here, or we can uh, calculate the uh, distributed uh, uh, forces in uh, the steel shell elements, uh, as you see here, in the longitudinal direction, or we can calculate it, the composed surfaces, the distributed bending moments in the concrete for the weight load, is illustrated here, or the distributed actual forces, as is illustrated here. So what you see here is a contour plot in the composed elements in which the distributed actual forces are integrated from the stresses in the solid elements in the bridge deck. And we can do the same, of course, for all loads, also for a truck load, which is located somewhere here. And you see again here the displacements or the bending moment, uh, the uh, actual, uh, the distributed uh, actual forces or uh, the bending moments in uh, the concrete uh, slab or the actual forces. And what we can do in the design analysis is that we define load combinations. Load combinations, different load combinations in which every load 
in which every time the permanent loadings are multiplied by the safety factor, uh, truck position in the first lane multiplied by a safety factor and a truck position in the second lane. And as we had uh, all the permanent loadings are included in all combination, uh, we had six positions for the first lane and we had six positions for the second lane. In total we have 36 load combinations. And over these different load combinations we will calculate envelopes, so we will scan for the minimum and maximum value of critical loads, the bending moments and, and forces over all these 36 load combinations. And that's what we do automatically in uh, these design checks. And the output that we get for these scans, uh, uh, these envelopes uh, of, uh, of results, are for example the following. We can calculate uh, uh, for each uh, load combination, for each uh, load case, for example, uh, uh, actual forces, or for an envelope. This is an envelope over the maximum MXX over all the 36 load combinations and it gives us uh, yeah, the results uh, NXX. Um, and these results can also be used for uh, calculating uh, the uh, amount of uh, reinforcement that is required. So here we see for the top grid in the longitudinal direction, uh, the uh, required above, uh, over applied in the X direction uh, with an averaging applied for the envelope over the MXX uh, maximum value. We see here the same for another grid. This is uh, the top grid in, uh, no, this is the bottom grid in the longitudinal direction and the same for uh, the top grid direction or the bottom uh, grid in the transverse direction. And in this case, um, yeah, you see that uh, some checks uh, do not satisfy because they come up with values which are larger than, uh, than one. We can do similar check, another check that can be done is the check on shear force. So then we do an envelope over the shear forces. This is the QXZ, uh, the maximum value, but we could do also envelopes uh, over other shear forces and then for example the minimum value. And the uh, shear, check, shear force checks that are illustrated in these contour plots are, uh, for example, the unity check, uh, the maximum shear force in the X direction or in the, uh, in the Y direction. For the same analysis, we will also do a stiffness adaptation analysis. The same model do a stiffness adaptation analysis, in which in this sheet I once more explain how the crack width is, uh, is defined. So you see a stress strain. Uh, curve with the red uh, line and assume that we are on, uh, on this location on the stress uh, strain curve then we have total strain which is the sum of the crack strain and the elastic strain and the elastic strain we can easily calculate by dividing this stress by the initial Young's modulus. So that gives this value. So the crack strain is the total strain minus the actual stress divided by the uh, uh, initial uh, Young's modulus. And this gives a tensor, the crack strain tensor, and we calculate the first principal value of this and multiply that by the crack bandwidth. That's the definition of the crack width in this analysis. So we look here to top view of the bridge deck and a bottom view of the bridge deck. Uh, and we apply first a weight load times uh, 0 point, uh, 1.25 and the contour plots that you see here is uh, crack width. Uh, crack width uh, up to uh, 0 0.2 millimeters is uh, colored in blue. Uh, from 0 0.2 to 0 0.4 it is green and above it is, uh, is red. So in the next loading increment we apply the permanent loadings and we still, still see no significant cracks. And then the cracking comes in at those locations at the bottom 
where the concrete slab is uh, supported by these uh, uh, intermediate uh, supports. And these cracks are really not realistic because they are caused by uh, the interface elements which do not allow a reduction, do not apply a reduction of stiffness when the interface is opening. This stiffness adaptation in Diana 9.5 is still based on fully nonlinear of a linear elastic uh, analysis. Interface elements can be applied, but interface elements stiff give linear elastic behavior. In new version, uh, which is scheduled uh, in the coming uh, months, we will uh, uh, allow defining a uh, no tension uh, characteristic in interface elements for stiffness adaptation analysis. When we increase the loading, uh, we see similar behavior up to a load factor number three when some larger damage is noticed at some here of the slab uh, and then at the location where the local uh, where the truck load is uh, located we see uh, yeah strongly increase of uh, of the crack so this is a critical condition up to a load factor 4 and that increases very rapidly when we go to a load factor number 5 so that gives you much more insight in where the damage occurs in the concrete slab and what is the remaining loading capacity of, uh, of the bridge. That brings us to the conclusion of this, uh, this webinar. I think uh, I have uh, shown to you that structural details can be considered in finite element analysis very accurately when you use solid elements in, uh, in these and that with the new application uh, in Diana the required amount of reinforcement can be checked uh, in, uh, in both reduced elements and solid element models and also in solid element models with all these details included unity checks according to design codes uh, uh, can be averaged as part of the analysis. So it's not something that the user needs to do, do by, uh, by hand after the analysis. Uh, it's part of the analysis. Diana does that for you. It just gives you the contour plots, which yeah, gives you a lot of insight in uh, what's the loading capacity of, uh, of the model. And stiffness adaptation analysis uh, yeah, is an tool that is easy to use to give you insight in crack width uh, development for different loadings uh, of your model. The nice thing is that all these analysis, both the design checks, the linear elastic analysis and the stiffness adaptation analysis are done with the same finite element mesh. So you don't have any discussions anymore whether uh, uh, simplifications that you may have been needed to do in your uh, model uh, uh, because you were forced with uh, the reduced to use reduced elements whether they are allowed and what are the consequences of this you can model full details using full information from a BIM model in your analysis model and then the software can do the unity checks and give you insight in the development of the cracks. Thank you for, uh, for your attention. Now I'm uh, giving back to, uh, to Mars.